Ring of Fire Press presents conversations around Joy Ward's campfire. This edition, Joy chats with David Drake, author of Old Nathan. It's uh, a chilly morning and being with us here. Uh, I know our readers are going to love hearing from you. And for those of you who are listening in, this is David Drake, the much beloved author of many science fiction and fantasy books and he has stolen many many hours of sleep from all of us and we're here to talk with him about a, a book that's not really a new book but it's in re-release yes. nathan old nathan yes. and as i understand from your acknowledgement this is one of your favorite books to have written it is it could is. you help me tell me about that um what makes this one of your um Central North Carolina. You're at Duke. Yes. He lives nearby. Yes. And um, I had been reading Manly since I was 13, uh, Ace Doubles um, and um, Avalon, hardcover science fiction. So I knew Manly, or I knew of him, and really liked his stuff. Um, his science fiction tended to be juvenile in feel. He wrote a lot of juveniles also, but his, um, his actual science fiction was, you know, rather juvenile. And as a result, it was perfect for libraries. And I was entirely getting my fiction through libraries at the time the Clinton Public Library. Mm -hmm. um, but we moved to Durham, North Carolina. He lived outside Chapel Hill and I had very slight contact with him before I was drafted. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I, I, I met him, I, mm -hmm. I literally arranged a meeting with him before I was sent to Nam, uh, oh. figuring if I got my ass blown away, I was going to regret not having connected with Manly Wade Wellman uh, more than anything else I could think of. Um, didn't happen. Uh, connected with him, that is, but um, I, I had three... No, go ahead. No, no, but you came back, so that was good. Oh, thing. yes. Yes, I did. Um, I, I didn't even have a bad war, really. Um, I, I was with a, an elite unit, 11th Armored Cavalry, and um, with an elite unit, with a cav at least, Black Horse, um, you always trusted the men you were with to do their fucking jobs. Um, well, I mean, you couldn't trust very much. You mm -hmm. sure couldn't trust the uh, people making the decisions. But the people you were with, you know, they were okay. And um, so I came back. And one of my, one of the guys I was in Cambodia with, um, Larry Barnthouse, mm -hmm had been a college buddy of a fellow named Carl Edward Wagner. Um, you know, they'd, they'd been at mm -hmm. Kenyon together. Mm -hmm. And um, Carl sent Larry a copy of his first novel. And he got it when we were in Cambodia and mm -hmm. he then lent it to me to read. So I knew of, I, I sort of knew of Carl because Manley had mentioned him, this friend of his, um, young friend who was in med school and was um, trying to write this Robert E. Howard stuff, mm -hmm. which Manley didn't have a lot of use for, to be honest, but uh, I did. But um, so 
I got back to the world and Larry, Larry had come back a month earlier, mm -hmm. quite reasonably feeling that he was not ready to re-enter grad school, which he'd been drafted out of. This was part of our uh, magnificent war effort, drafting people out of law school in my case. Uh, Larry was getting his PhD in zoology at oh, the okay. university. Uh, yeah, University of Chicago. I mean, you know, they were really getting the best and the brightest. They really right. were. Um, we're and, putting them in the wrong place, but oh, well, well, yeah, uh, you know, it, it helps to be smart in a combat situation also, it really does. I bet. Um, I bet. Whether it was the best use of manpower, I don't know, apparently Mr. McNamara uh, thought so, but God knows most of what he thought was wrong. Um, I, I think this was another case of that. But um, anyway, mm -hmm. you know, Larry came back and he visited Carl mm -hmm. in Chapel Hill because he was taking it. Uh, Larry was taking a year off or a semester off because he wasn't ready to go back to school. Sure. Me, <laughs> I got an early out. Uh, I came back to the world um, mm -hmm. and um, 72 hours after I was in transit camp at mm -hmm. Long Bin, I was in the lounge of Duke University Law School, meeting my new classmates, none of whom I knew pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd been drafted right in the middle of my second year. Right. So everybody I'd been with was gone, mm -hmm. except for a few that I didn't actually know, but there had been 10 of us left the class at the same time. Um, at least some of the others were drafted like I was. And, um, but I, I didn't get, I knew some of the professors. Um, but anyway, uh, Carl invited me and my wife to dinner with Larry and we went over, mm -hmm. had dinner and I got to know him pretty well. Um, basically saw him daily for 23 years. Um, he had stayed close to Manly, and I got to know Manly really well through Carl. And um, his old Nathan, his John the Balladeer mm -hmm. stories were very, very powerful, very good stories. And um, after Manly died pretty horribly, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, he he fell over and broke his elbow. Oh, uh, no. he, he he had diabetes. He fell <laughs> over and broke his elbow, and the orthopedic department put him back together. Did an incredibly good job. Um, problem was, it hurt him to move. Right. So he didn't move. Gotcha. He had diabetes. He sat in the chair with a hassock under his heels mm -hmm. for three days and he got bed sores. Oh, poor man. And over the next 10 months, they killed him. Oh, uh, took off increasingly large chunks of him. Um, finally, his legs. This, this was pretty awful for Manly. And wasn't great for his wife either. I bet. The uh, whole well, family uh, was probably in trouble with that. Well, it was just Manly and Francis, but um, Manly was not a good patient and he had nothing else to be. And right. um, I had, Lesson. you know, I had transportation, you know, trustworthy mm -hmm. transportation. So I went over and saw Manly three, three or four days a week. 
mm-hmm. for 10 months and then he died. And um, Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for his passing, but now moving forward, what made you want to do the, the Nathan stories, the basically um, an, an homage to the John the Balladeer? What yes, made you, basically. what did that? Um, how, did, how did that come about in the sense of what made you decide to do that? Closest I could be to Manly. He was mm-hmm. dead. Um, you know, I didn't start writing them until after Manley's death, but I started mm-hmm. writing them about at Manley's death. Gotcha. And, um, gotcha. And now as you look at those stories, and I know that Jim Bain was good enough to publish them the first time for you, but as you look at those stories and you've said that they are some of your favorite. Yes. What, what would you tell readers who are who mainly know you through space opera and fantasy and you know all the the many 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 series that you've done what would you say to them about old nathan and about reading old nathan why should they um they are a really good though i say it myself um, case of historical fantasy. Mm-hmm. I set them in the 1830s in central Tennessee, which is where my dad moved after he retired. He moved to a place, well, actually eastern Tennessee. Um, Hohenwald, Tennessee. And uh, I visited him there a few times. Um, I didn't see as much my dad as I really should have um, after I got back to the world because I had broken with my mother mm-hmm. and um, you know I, I got uh, letters why have you not responded to the box of cookies I shipped you didn't they get there? Well, they had gotten there, and and I appreciated it. But I was mm-hmm. in I was in war zone C, and right. uh, you know I was not in a mood to have this kind of crap. Uh, and I I said so because I'd lost everything. I mean, yeah. And uh, I didn't need to be badgered about that. So. I really, I broke with mom and that meant no contact with the family. So I don't regret what I did. I very much regret that I found it necessary, but, um, and I won't say Manly took the place of my dad because they were very different men. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, he's, certainly didn't um but sorry i i couldn't get back my dad Mm -hmm. but i could do this for manly this with manly and so they're they have an emotional resonance with me that not everything does. Um, They're not just stories, but they are stories. Well, isn't life a story? I mean, everything's a story ultimately. So saying they're just stories, they sound like very, very dear stories to you. They are. Which is important, which is very important. Um, They were an attempt to put folk tales, English folk tales, Mm -hmm. into um, 1830s Tennessee milieu. And I'm proud of them. Uh, They're very hard to write because I wanted Mm -hmm. to get the dialect right. And that took me months of reading material to get them 
I thought, right. And they read pretty well now, I think. Are you planning on doing any follow-ups to them? Another, no. another set of stories? No. Okay. No. Um, I did two stories. And then... Basically, Jim said he was willing to take a book of them. So I wrote the book mm -hmm. um, and Jim published it. Um, he, I'd had a, a rough time with him for a while. Mm -hmm. And actually this case, it wasn't my fault. Um, Jim was, um, wacky on prescription drugs in the late 80s. Um, and we'd had a rough time and I basically, I withdrew. Um, didn't stop working for him, but uh, we'd had a rough time. When he realized that the problem was Seldane and not me, so he was having hallucinations. Bless it's, him. Oh, it was the damnedest thing. I don't know, Walt, were you around then? Oh, well, Walt's not. I don't know if Walt's oh. listening in or not. I don't, I don't know that Walt yeah. was. was his, his face yeah, is... Around. Oh, he was around. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, Jim was getting very strange around 1988. Um, it was the damnedest thing. Uh, he was wacko on Seldane, uh, which is an antihistamine, which he's trying to get me onto. I refused to put pills in me for choice. Well, you probably saw a fair amount of, of drug usage. <laughs> oh, so yes. You probably were yeah. not up for that. I, I understand. I had a, an uncle at Nam, so I totally get it. Yeah. Um, that's very difficult. But, yeah. well, now they, let me... Let, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Please. no, the only ones in Nam that were really bad were uh, the ones who were on heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pot. I mean, look, uh, 25, uh, a reefer, a pack of reefers, Cambodian mm -hmm. reefers uh, with paper filters uh, was $1 in the field. Right. And, you know, th that was harmless or probably mm -hmm. not smoking him and but you were talking about base camp right um, so uh that that wasn't a problem um seldane was a problem heroin was a problem sure <laughs> yeah heroin's Stag. always a problem yes mm -hmm. yeah you're absolutely right well let me also ask you a question i never got to ask you is you came back and you were going to be a lawyer Yes. But you turned into a writer. How did that happen? Well, not really. Well, I, uh, I came back. I finished law school. And I was getting together with Manley and Carl Wagner mm -hmm. evenings, occasionally. And uh, I was trying to write. And I was writing, I was writing historical fantasies mm -hmm. set in the third century Rome. There wasn't a huge amount of uh, market for that at the time. Uh, but um, Manley suggested that I, uh, I used my Vietnam background and, you know, Carl was on that too. Um, he was a Vietnam background. And because that was unusual at the time, you know, mm -hmm. nobody was writing about Nam. So I did. But I was just using it as a setting. Um, but I found a funny thing. Um, not only could I sell the military SF, um, which is a reason to write it. But um, it was popular uh, and it, it really was unique. Mm -hmm. um, 
there were other people writing military SF at the time, Joe Haldeman mm-hmm. and Jerry Cornell. Uh, but we're the, we were the exceptions. Um, and we were the exception in, in this sense, too, because we'd all been there. Mm-hmm. There, in the case of um, Jerry Pornell, was Korea, but it was real. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, you probably do Jerry some at oh. least. Oh, yeah, no, I interviewed Jerry's lovely man. Okay. Yes. Well, he, you know, he limps. Yes. He had shrapnel in his knee. Um, you know, Chinese artillery. Uh, I'll do it to you. Yeah. Uh, he was also stone deaf, which he explained mm-hmm. when somebody was complaining about his deafness that he had a mm-hmm. firing battery of 105s in Korea. And I knew what that meant. Yes. <laughs> but um, we had one five fives where I was. So um, that isn't what cost me my hearing. I've got a 10K notch. That was Mm. the tank artillery, you know, the tank main guns. Yeah. And uh, that's a very sharp crack. Unlike the, you know, when the the 155s were firing, if Mm -hmm. you were a distance, you could see our tents or mm-hmm. would sleep later in the night. Just, uh, you know, they would bell in from right. the muzzle blast. Wow. But that was fairly, that was a fairly low pressure as opposed to the 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter main guns, which wow. is very sharp crack. You know, that was basically a bullet mm-hmm. fired at the same velocity as a rifle only it was 22 pounds. Wow. Well, so. well back to your writing, I want to ask you some questions about where do you see yourself going now? What, what do you have in the hopper, so to speak, to write? Um, going to do another um, RCN novel, space opera. Uh, past the most recent book was um, odd sort of thing mm-hmm. we're calling Time of Heroes. Uh, it's basically the Morty Arthur. Ah. In, uh, but in a science fiction setting. But, you know, this is, you know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table in science fiction. Good story translates. Oh yeah, it does. Um, John Steinbeck rewrote them. Yep. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, I'm I'm doing something that's really basically sort of a shattered universe Mm. in which there are odd things and um, hid from the sticks. Um, gets involved in, if you will, King Arthur's court. We don't call it that. Right. Commonwealth right. man. Well, now I know you're also a Latin student. Yes, um, I was. Are there, is there any, well, I mean, you're, you're very, very accomplished. I mean, if anybody looks at your background, you're terribly accomplished actually, almost scarily so. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> Are there any other parts of your your education, so to speak, that you want to bring out in your writing? Any other areas, places you want to go write that you haven't yet? Didn't know where. I'm in a situation I can write about anything I want to. Mm -hmm. And I am doing that. Uh, The, um, I was using Tor for my fantasy Mm-hmm. and selling the um, science fiction to Bain. And then the Tor mm-hmm. ran into problems with selling fantasy yep. and uh, 
told me to, well, Tom did, told me to uh, concentrate on military SF because Dave Weber was selling that very well for him. He'd gone right. to them. And um, I didn't want to do that. Um, I thought closest I could come was doing these Arthurian novels. Wasn't close enough. So I left Tor, which I regret. <laughs> but, uh, you know, basically, um, Bain continues to be a home. And um, there could be doing the best. Yeah, yeah. And, but, you uh, know, you are always welcome to join us at Eric Flint's Rig and Fire Press with any of that work. <laughs> so just letting you know, putting a plug for the, for the home team. That's just, well, <laughs> I, uh, Eric talked to me when he was writing 1632. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we talked a lot. And yeah. I, yeah. I wasn't a resource for him, but I, I could talk to Jim Bain mm -hmm. and, not everybody could talk to Jim. Um, and toward the end, when he, you know, he had serious health problems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he was getting flakier. I could still talk to him and I could talk to Eric. <laughs> so I was That's sort talent. of a go between. Yeah. Um, Eric and I had gotten along very well since um, Jim called him in to develop my outlines. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I got somebody to, to do the outline. All right, mm -hmm. I got somebody to do the, the novels from your outlines. He's a commie, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, it's fine with me. Uh, I mean, whether the person would be okay, I didn't know. Yeah. But sure, I, I had no problem with, I, I'd rather deal with a commie that way than the way I had been in Nam. Uh, a little different. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, um, Eric and I got along fine, but, um, So long as Bain keeps selling my books and able to sell my books, I'll keep writing for Bain. Sure. I understand. I wasn't serious about trying to I know, to I know, away. I know, Just but I was being honest well. with you all through. Sure. Absolutely. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and if you were going to tell a reader who is starting to read your work, where would you tell them to start? What, with the what lightnings. Book? The, li the lightnings? With the lightnings. With yes. the lightnings. What is it about that book that makes it the place to start for you? It's, um, it's the first of the RCN series, space operas. Um, I've written better books, but it's a good one. And um, my better books tend to be Military SF is rather hard edged. Mm -hmm. um, I could put that more strongly in the case of Redliners. And I would not recommend anybody start me, start reading mm -hmm. me there. Um, it's a great book. Uh, Old Nathan is a very good book, mm -hmm. but it's idiosyncratic. And um, if you're not into dial dialect history, um, it's not the one to start with. I'm proud of it. Oh, you should be. You should very much be. Um, are you planning any other kind of off the, off the, the usual books? No. Maybe not like old Nathan, but something unusual. Oh. No. Um, no, but then if the mood strikes me, 
and I can sell Tony on it. I'll, uh, which, you know, I'm, sure. I'm fairly sure. confident, but um, I, I did an unusual, it's technically RCN, mm -hmm. but it's a very different sort of book, um, To Clear Away the Shadows. It's a yes. recent one. And um, it's very much different, different characters entirely. So no interest in using your law background? No, like going into, no. You know, the John Grisham kind of thing? No, no. <laughs> uh, John Grisham is actually a very good writer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but no, I... See, the, gonna, the thing is, mm -hmm. um, I didn't get into writing to make money. I got into writing to keep me between the ditches. I was, you know, I came back to the world really screwed up mm -hmm. and um, really nuts. And the writing sort of centered me, gave me something gave me a chance to get what I felt out in public mm -hmm. in a, a fashion that was socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. Some of the other thoughts I was having were not socially acceptable. And I'm smart enough to have known that. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't necessarily have helped me, but uh, I... Um, I found that writing kept me between the ditches and um, that comes through pretty clearly in the stuff I wrote before I wrote with the lightnings mm -hmm. or uh, the fantasy series I started about the same time, um, Lord of the Isles. The Isles series, mm -hmm. and um, so as I say, I uh, I would probably be able to sell Tony on something off trail, but I don't have any desire to. I've I've written some good books, and I'm yeah. going to continue to try and write good books but I don't have anything to prove to anybody. I rode with the Absolutely black horse. Not. No, no, <laughs> no, you've got a, you've got a very strong um, history of great writing and great sales. So I don't think you're, you have anything to prove. I absolutely agree. Um, but it does sound like if I were writing your memoir, it would be something like between the ditches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, You know, I, I didn't volunteer for NOM, God knows. Mm -hmm. um, and it was horrible waste of time. Everybody's waste of time. Killed a lot of people, a lot more dinks than us, but mm -hmm. enough Americans to be noticeable. It made a, made a, yeah, it's got a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but it was... It was the most important thing in my in my history. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I wouldn't be me without that. I don't much like the me that I've been, but um, you know that didn't quit. It's still with me. So. Well, what's oh. what's really good is that you've been able to take that time in Nam. Um, and use it, find a use. Oh yeah, it. and that's so valuable. And I think we can all learn from that. Uh, well, I hope you don't have to. <laughs> I hope nobody well, has to. Well, I think everybody has things in their lives that are hard. You know, like right sure. now we've got the pandemic going on. A lot of people are kind of freaking out with that. But if we can learn from what you're saying, which is take the hard times and use them, then we'll all yeah. be better. Yes. Uh, remember Journal of the Plague Year. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, this is not the first time there's been medical unpleasantness in the lives oh, yeah. of human oh, yeah. beings. Look at the Decameron. Mm -hmm. You know, the Black Death was worse than COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Boccaccio got quite a lot of stories out of that time. Oh, yes. Yes. There's some great writing that comes that involves the plague, the various plagues. So you're mm. right. You're right. But, well, is there any last things you'd like to, to say to the readers? As we, um, sign, as we go into the sunset, so to speak. Though you've got a gorgeous <laughs> view behind you there. It's not very sunsetty, but it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, Lovely trees. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Wow. Mm, I, I love the bank of windows. Oh, that's more. I'm t I've got window yeah. envy. That's yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, when we built this house in the middle of 23 acres, Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, we bought the land and then mm -hmm. I built the house in the middle of it as I could gather up money to pay the builder. Mm -hmm. It was built by the architect himself wow. with one, one helper. That's lovely. So yes. do you share this home with any pets? Our pet friendly uh, readers yes. want to know that. Um, I'm, I'm looking. Okay. <laughs> I think he's gone inside, but um, I, I would show you Red, who is our dog. Uh, oh. We have had various rescue dogs. Red is the current one. He is, uh, he looks like a Jack Russell Terrier. Oh, yeah. But he's 25. Yeah. He, he, he's 25 pounds, so we, you know, we fed him up. He's not mm -hmm. fat, but, um, and we have for many years had a cat or cats, mm -hmm. but, cool. um, well, I, I miss them. Um, last one died and my wife doesn't want to get another, which oh, is, no. well, it's okay. I mean, you know, Red's a, a great dog, um, but um, we don't have a cat with us. We have lots of birds in the uh, trees. I, I'm going to show you the feeder. Cool. Yes. Beautiful view. Absolutely beautiful. Yes. You, you win the uh, the award for gorgeous view. Uh, yes, and it's the the house is also also, you know, the architect was an artist, mm -hmm. genuinely, and um, so the house is great also, and I That's I lovely. recommend it. Well, I think every good writer, a great writer, should have a great place to write from. So that's very cool. That's very, very cool. And all the best to Red. I used to have a horse named Red, not a dog. Never had a dog named Red, but I had a horse. Who was Never kind of had like a horse. Kind of mm, yeah, yeah. Um, we've had some very big, powerful dogs. Red is mm -hmm. a small, attractive one, but um, Sam, Mm -hmm. who was, um, he, he looked like a German short hair, short hair pointer. Uh, oh, but yeah, he was yeah. A, yeah. But he was 100 pounds. Again, he... That's a lot. I think it's just, yes, for, for GSP, but mm -hmm. um, he had great teeth. I came home one day and found him, he'd torn the... Um, downspout off the house <laughs> you know what the hell's that and then i he had a squirrel inside it and he, he had a purpose. Clamped, he'd clamped it with his teeth i'm showing you something now <laughs> i 
Okay, he clamped it with his teeth. Yes, and it was inside still. And, and he was he was trying to get at the squirrel. He was not able to. He was not able to actually get to it. But uh, I I took the downspout away from him and saved that portion. <laughs> uh, um, well, he you was know, trying to do you a service. Yeah, yeah. Well, I um, we were plagued with squirrels, and I have seen Sam. Um, we had a we have a cherry tree right beside the back of the garage. Mm -hmm. It's fairly low on the ground. The back of the garage isn't very high off the ground. And um, I saw Sam leap off the garage roof through the cherry tree and come down on the, on the other side with a squirrel in his jaws. Uh, I guess I shouldn't laugh because the poor squirrel, but go Sam. Well, uh, it, it wasn't in pain very long. I'm, I bet. I'm Red, come here. Red, Red, come meet your phantom. I think I see him back there. Yes. Hey, Red. Yes. Okay, now why do you call him Red? Because I see black and white. No, that is red and white. Oh, okay, okay. Just my poor iPad. No. Here. Well, it, it's the, uh, you know, this probably isn't the. Uh, he looks lovely. Yes. He, he you should a, definitely include him in some stories. We'll he deserves to, to be a character. Well, we've got Sam, the current one. Mm hmm Cool. And, um, and I've Okay. Used well, well, David, I am getting the, um, the word from the techie gnome that we, it's time for us to, to shut it down. Okay. But I want to thank you so very much. I do hope you're going to join us at some of the open houses for Ring of Fire, uh, which are going to be happening on the first Saturdays of every month now. And we would love to see you. And I can't wait to finish Old Nathan. Uh, I am have very you read excited. Some of it? Got started. Got started. I'm a slow reader because of my eyes, but it is really... Hmm really fascinating. I'm from Tennessee and I'm very familiar with that accent. So it's not that mm. hard for me to read as an accent, but it is fascinating. It is really, really cool. So thank you well, very much for writing it and, and immortalizing Manly that way. That was a very cool thing to do. Well, so thank you so much. And I wish you and your, your lady wife, Good day, and I hope you have a wonderful and red. Please give a pet for me. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much again, and I'll look forward to future chats with you. My Take pleasure. Take care. Thanks. You continue to be a great interviewer.